as well. Uh, yeah, so I have flax is one of the things I like to talk about. Um, I don't know if this will play or not, but we can try it. It's a quick video here, but I will test it out on this device. I don't think it's going to play, but it, it's all right. It's, a, it's actually a commercial that you may have seen uh, by the drug company for EpiPens, um, and it's pretty dramatic. It's a girl who is having an allergic reaction, and the camera angle is, is basically a, of one of her friends and how frantic it is and how quickly things happen. And so it's, it's, it's actually um, a good video for teaching because I think it's relatively realistic of, of what can happen. The why about this disease, it's, um, it's pretty important. Um, there aren't many diseases that we deal with pre-hospital or in the ED arena that kill a patient as quickly as anaphylaxis. And the types of patients it can kill, uh, it doesn't really discriminate. Um, you know, we think about cardiac arrest in the older patient, um, you know, and, and uh, how much, how quickly the time interventions need to happen, you know, time to compressions, time to defibrillation. Well, um, the, the interventions in this disease are just as important, and um, the mortality is, is pretty impressive when an anaphylactic reaction gets out of hand and is not controlled early on. Um, and so it is, it is sort of the quintessential emergency medicine, pre-hospital emergency care disease. You have to recognize it quickly. You have to treat it quickly. If you do those two things, things should be okay. If you don't, um, then, um, then some really bad things can happen. Are we, are we uh, not? Uh, apparently, they're not seeing your slides. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Are we good now? Uh, we think. Carry on. We can... We can more or less. Good. I'm better for radio anyway. But uh, <laughs> um, we'll fix it here in a second. So uh, then the other question after after you know recognizing and knowing how to treat it is knowing uh, whether you should treat it or not. Is this anaphylaxis or is this an, a, an just a, a general allergic reaction that does not involve a systemic reaction that's life threatening? Treatment is the number one thing that we have to understand and be very comfortable with and not afraid of. And um, when we talk about what things can go wrong, we'll see that the delays in treatment are where people die and, uh, and are, are the, thing, the, the, the one thing that is most associated with a death from anaphylaxis. And then talk about what should happen with these patients, how long should they be observed, how, who can go home, what are the risk factors for a severe allergic reaction that's likely to come back. So I always think the history of diseases and who who figured things out is pretty cool to look at um, because, um, you know, a lot of stuff has been figured out at this point, but, but um, just when, when we didn't have the computer technology, when we didn't have all the biochemistry, when we didn't have all the immunology, people still figured out that there was something called anaphylaxis. And so, um, you know, around the turn of the century, uh, there was a gentleman that actually won a Nobel Prize because of his work in anaphylaxis, and he was a French physician named Charles Roche. And what he did was he, um, the way a lot of diseases got figured out was you injected different substances into animals, and then you saw what happened to those animals. And so they were trying to figure out a way to protect animals from certain toxins. If you think about the work that was done on immunizations, you, you basically, you give the person a little bit of injection of a protein, and then after a period of time, the body will, will um, be able to recognize that protein and actually protect, develop immune system that will protect against that particular disease in the future. They were trying to look for things like that for some of the toxins, but what they found was if you gave certain animals this toxin and then you re-challenged them, um, that the, the, the the drug, the, the challenge was even more lethal for some of the animals than the original toxin. So it was, it was not protection, it was the opposite of protection. So that's kind of where we get anaphylaxis, which is the opposite of protection. And so there are some immune systems, the mast cells and the basophils that are basically set up ready to explode with histamine bombs if they get if they get uh, exposure to this particular protein that the body's been sensitized to. And that's essentially what happens with anaphylaxis. It probably has some protective effect 
if, if you have a local reaction, like you've got an in intestinal worm and your body wants to wall that off and, and it recognizes that protein is not a normal protein and it's not, it's foreign to the body. So it basically explodes these histamine bombs to bring all these other infection fighting cells into the intestine to fight this, this intestinal parasite. But if that reaction happens across your body, it causes all kinds of problems with airway swelling and loss of all of the fluid in your body into your out of your vascular system. And that's essentially what happens with, with uh, anaphylaxis. So you basically, your body gets sensitized, and if it finds this drug and antigen again, uh, these cells are just set up to basically auto-destroy and, uh, and cause this generalized reaction. You have to have an allergen or a haptin. You have to have these specific types of immune system, uh, cells uh, and, and the IgE antibodies. And then basically this reaction happens and it becomes a non-localized systemic reaction, which is life-threatening. So what's the difference between a minor allergic reaction and, and, uh, and a life-threatening one like anaphylaxis? So we see hives, which is, you know, all the time, red welts, they're coming and going, associated with the itching. And, um, and that is, it's generalized, but it only involves the skin. It doesn't involve the airway. You're not, you don't have associated hypotension with it. And, um, and so that can be treated as, as a minor allergic reaction uh, with the things that we generally use like benzo or, uh, Benadryl, you know, antihistamines, diphenhydramine, other antihistamines, um, and steroids perhaps. Um, and, and that's not life-threatening. Um, but there are situations where a reaction would classify as anaphylaxis, and it is life-threatening. And there's three basic categories that have been defined by the group that studies anaphylaxis and wants to talk about anaphylaxis a lot. And so if you have skin findings or mucosal findings and either respiratory symptoms or hypotension or syncope or incontinence, you know, some sort of loss of control, then what the skin plus one of those two others would be defined as, as anaphylaxis. Or you could have uh, two or more of that constitution, that constellation of symptoms. So you could have skin findings plus decreased blood pressure or respiratory symptoms plus GI symptoms. What that's showing is it's not just involving a localized problem. It's, it's generalized and you need to worry about it because it can become life-threatening very, very quickly. Um, and so that's the other concept of an acute illness with two or more of these signs. Or you could just have an exposure to, you know, an allergen um, for that patient, and now you've got a low blood pressure, and you have anaphylaxis without without respiratory compromise, without skin findings, and and the tricky thing is probably about 10% of cases of anaphylaxis present with no skin findings. We all think the patient should come in with swelling of face, and they should come in with hives everywhere, and they should be short of breath, and and it's probably not hard to say that's that's a pretty bad allergic reaction and I better treat that aggressively. Um, but if they don't have the skin findings, you could get off track really fast. And so just know that for patients with known ex allergens and low blood pressure, that in itself, um, if they have an exposure, is high, is is anaphylaxis. So these are the constitution, you know, the three categories that have been defined by the groups that that. Have, have tried to come up with a standardized definition so that we can talk about this and study it and develop protocols for it. The sensitivity, if you use this system, is about 97%, and it'll pick up, all, you know, over, you know, four out of five of these cases will be, if you have these things, that's what the problem is. It's anaphylaxis. Now, the thing about anaphylaxis is it doesn't just cause airway problems. It can cause a total collapse of the blood pressure. And the way this happens is all of the blood, all of the capillaries in the body become leaky. And they become leaky very, very quickly. And so there have been anesthesia studies that show uh, with patients that are in surgery and have anaphylaxis, and you draw blood on those patients, they, what's, what's been shown is their hematocrit will rise dramatically because their, their blood cells are much more concentrated. They've lost all the all the uh, extravascular or all of the, the fluid um, the, you know, in the plasma is basically leaking out of the blood vessels. The blood cells remain, and so the hematocrit goes up. So it shows that about 35% of the blood volume can, can be lost very, very quickly, over minutes. 
This is like hemorrhagic shock. If you basically open up a very large artery, let a patient bleed out for a few minutes, and this is what you would essentially what you would have, except in this situation, all the blood vessels are leaky. It's not one big vessel that's leaking, it's all the vessels are leaking. So where do those vessels that are leaking, where are they gonna cause the most problem? Well, they're gonna cause the most problem in the head and neck because we've got great blood flow, blood supply there and the capillaries can become very, very leaky. And so you swell all of, into all this soft tissue of the throat, of the airway, of the face, and you can get an airway obstruction very quickly from that. And then there are phases of anaphylaxis. So this is a disease that happens quickly and gets bad really quickly too, most of the time. So the, 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 the symptoms, the peak symptoms are 30 to 60 minutes after an exposure. Think about sepsis, for example. You've got a patient that gets an infection, there's a systemic reaction to that infection, and then, it's, and then at some point, the body is no longer compensating and we're not delivering enough oxygen to the body to basically continue the, the metabolic functions of the body. That, that takes a lot more than 30 or 60 minutes. That takes hours or days to develop, but that's a life-threatening diagnosis that we worry a lot about. This one is, is really scary because it doesn't give you any time to prepare for it. And so that's why we've got to do some things up front, uh, both the behavior of the patients and the, patient, the people that take care of patients like parents and how prepared we are in an EMS and an emergency department setting to take care of this disease. Um, and so we absolutely have to be the undisputed experts on this disease. <laughs> I'm, you know, while immunologists or allergists in their office will treat anaphylaxis, they don't see it the way we see it. And we see, um, we see the worst of the worst and we see delays in diagnosis. And so we have to be the ones. You're not gonna have time to consult anybody. You have to know the drugs, you have to know the indications, and you have to know what to do when those first set of drugs don't work. Um, so we, are, we, we own this disease. Um, these, we also have to know this is a common problem. I mean, guys in the back, uh, how, many, how long has it been since you treated an anaphylaxis reaction in the ED? Maybe a week. Yeah, a week. If you said a month, I'd be really, really pretty surprised. Um, it, you know, so every time I'm working in the ER and I see allergic reaction pop up on the triage board, I want to know where that patient is and what's going on with them. Is it minor? Is it hives? Or is it anaphylaxis? Because if it's anaphylaxis, I want to start treating it in triage. I, I, this is not a disease to mess around with, and it will only get worse if you don't treat it appropriately. So um, we have to know these patients are common, and we have to know the right treatment. Otherwise, we're going to put the patient at great risk. Now, if you look at the evidence and you look at, at, at you know, the mortality for this disease and you look at autopsies and you do, the, you do a review of, of what happens when patients die of anaphylaxis, you see some common themes. And the common themes are that either we don't give it epinephrine quickly enough um, or we don't give it at all. And that's really sad if a patient dies of anaphylaxis and there was no dose of epinephrine given. And that, 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 that's happened. And there's lots of studies that show this, and I won't go through all those in detail. But, but these are the errors that can happen um, in, in treating anaphylaxis. How fast do we need to treat it? Um, and and uh, we'll talk about some of the studies, but I won't go through them in a lot of detail. What's the median time uh, from onset to death? And it kind of depends on some factors uh, of the exposure. So for foods, 30 minutes. That's, that's, uh, that's oftentimes the presentation time. Um, or when people have died, that's the, 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 the duration from the exposure to the time of death, 30 minutes. Hymenopterous stings, these are the, the bee stings, honeybees, wasps, others, uh, 15 minutes from exposure to time of death, uh, the median time of death. And then medication-induced, this is really scary. We have even less time for a medication-induced. And one of the reasons for this is it's because it's happening in the hospital. We gave the patient IV penicillin. And, and that patient has had a massive reaction very, very quickly. Now, the question is, how quickly can you get epinephrine out of your Pyxis? Or, um, you know, and, and we should probably, you know, we do all these, these, we do simulation for cardiac arrest. We do simulation for trauma at times. We really need to do simulation for anaphylaxis. To walk into the ER right now and tell the nurses, I've got a patient with severe anaphylaxis, get how fast can we get the, you know, show me how fast we can get a dose of intramuscular epinephrine into the patient and, and, and see how many minutes that would take. I bet it will take more than a couple minutes. 
Uh, this was a patient uh, tattoo. What's this drug? You guys know? Yes? Epinephrine. Epinephrine, of course. So I, I don't know why you'd want an epinephrine tattoo, but you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's something you should do. It's like a medical alert badge, and I don't know, but um, epinephrine is the drug. It is the perfect drug for anaphylaxis. Um, it causes vasoconstriction. It uh, it basically will um, can can raise your heart rate if you're if you're bradycardic. It causes bronchodilation. Uh, it suppresses the the continual release of histamine. These like I said, these histamine bombs from the mast cells and the basophils. Uh, it it can increase your cardiac output. As I said, all of your blood vessels are leaky. You have no peripheral resistance. Everything is gone to zero, essentially, and so it can basically give you your peripheral resistance so you can maintain the blood pressure and perfuse your brain and your heart and, uh, and, and regain your consciousness and blood pressure. And it will also, most important for our, in, in, for what we need to be thinking about, it will decrease the mucosal edema and, and, uh, and decrease airway resistance so we have less of an airway problem uh, than, we do, than we did before. Now, it doesn't mean you still won't have to intubate a patient if you give epinephrine, but I guarantee you the chances you're going to have to intubate the patient will go down significantly if the faster you give epinephrine. Um, so these are the studies. There's, there's been lots of studies retrospectively that show that we delay giving epinephrine, we don't give it at all, or we give the wrong dose or the wrong route. And I won't go through this but uh, in a lot of detail, but just let me just suffice to say there is lots of evidence that, that we have not done a great job with this disease historically in emergency medicine and pre-hospital. Um, with deaths due to anaphylaxis, epinephrine was given before arrest in only 14% of, of fatal cases that were reviewed, and only 62% received any epi at all. Um, in a United Kingdom registry, 40% of deaths were due to anaphylactic uh, reactions did not receive any epinephrine. This is the biggest problem I see. And, and this is one of the things that I, I, the mindset I had early on in my career, and it's absolutely deadly. Um, the wait and see for, for Benadryl, for diphenhydramine. I'm going to wait and see if Benadryl works. If you have that mindset, you are automatically set up to fail with, with anaphylaxis because the epinephrine will not help fast enough. It may not help at all. And, and so you're basically delaying care and you're, you're, holding off on the drug that is curative on the drug that is inferior. And it's just, it's, it's a horrible mindset and don't, and it needs to be banished from every pre-hospital, every emergency medicine provider in the world. Um, so we have to give, give epinephrine at first if any signs of anaphylaxis happen. We look at anaphylaxis deaths and what are the causes of it. Um, medication induced is really one of the most deadly ways um, to, to cause anaphylaxis. Uh, some some are unspecified when when it's studied. Venom is fairly is, is happens as well, and then food it happens a lot. Fortunately, it isn't quite as deadly, but it can be deadly, um, and uh, and it's tricky too. I I just took care of a kid last week who's he was you know he's he's uh, at a party out of town with his parents. Um, they're staying in a hotel. Um, he basically goes to this party, eats some trail mix that has peanuts in it. They realize it, parents freak out, they bring him to the ER, they actually wait in the waiting room for about half an hour to see if anything happens. Nothing happens, so they leave, they feel, okay, we, we dodged a bullet. They leave, they get back to, they're on their way back to the hotel, um, and all of a sudden the child starts, just like that, having uh, facial swelling, wheezing, continual cough, kept spitting up all these secretions, you know, this, this five-year-old uh, child. They're terrified, they come back to the ER, we're able to recognize it quickly, we get the child treated. But they were diligent, they were trying to watch for this reaction. They didn't have their EpiPen because it was in the hotel. But they, um, but they, they, and they waited and so it, just like that, the disease turned on them and they, and, but they were able to, to get the patient treated and, and nothing bad happened, but it was very, very scary for them. Um, now this is, I, I told you this is a perfect drug. Everything's perfect about it for anaphylaxis except the way it's packaged and we have two different doses and it's very confusing and we don't even, we don't talk about drugs in one to 1,000 or one to 10,000 uh, concentrations, but we do for this drug and that's a problem. And it, it, it hasn't been solved yet, but we have, to, we have to realize it's a problem. We have to basically take extra steps uh, with our training to, to deal with it. 
Um, this is the one to 1,000 formulation, one milligram per milliliter. It's only given IM, never ever give it IV. Um, this is the one to 10,000, this is the cardiac epi. Uh, it is 0.1 milligrams per milliliter, um, and it has the carp eject that you see there. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, same drug, different concentrations, very confusing. Um, this, is, this is the one we use for anaphylaxis 99% of the time. We're going to we're going to give the dose, and I say 0.3 to 0.5. And if you look at the guidelines, nobody will ever commit. But it's my understanding that that most EMS protocols say 0.3, and that's what I give for an adult in the ED when the patient shows up. Um, and we have to, has to be IM. I sub Q does not work as well. It needs to be IM. Um, and it's uh, yeah, so you can give up to 0.5 per dose. Uh, the, the calculation is 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and that's for a child, we would definitely do the calculation. Although you'll see that, you know, the ep, there's, ep, there's, there's two EpiPens. There's an EpiPen Junior at 0.15 milligrams, and the regular EpiPen is 0.3 milligrams. And you say, what do I do if the kid isn't, you know, isn't 15 kilos to give the 0.15? Um, and, and I think the general answer is, you got a 10 kilo kid. They have a they have a junior EpiPen junior. You're going to give them have them use the, the junior EpiPen. It's just it's a lethal disease, and a little bit of extra epinephrine is not going to, is not going to make that big a difference. We always give it IM as I said. It's in the anterolateral thigh and the vastus lateralis. That's where you're going to have the best absorption, and that's where you want to give it. Um, this is the cardiac epi. Um, you can use. For an adult, you could use one milliliter of this uh, in 10 mils uh, of saline or nine mils of saline, and you could have a push um, if if you've got refractory epinephrine and your maybe two doses of sub Q, I mean of IM are not working, uh, then you could you could start a drip and give the and support the patient that way uh, as well. You know, um, a 0.1 milligram over 10 minutes or so uh, is one of the things that you can do if things are not working. Um, there is something called the dirty uh, epi drip, which is basically, um, you know, base, basically has been published by Aliam, an online uh, resource. Remove one milligram from either one of those two, put it in a thousand cc bag, and you could run that at one. Uh, my, if that's one microgram per milliliter, um, and just kind of give that wide open uh, to basically uh, um, try to prevent anaphylactic shock, a refractory anaphylactic shock. Um, what's this drug? So the, the first drug doesn't work. It usually works, but it, it just for some reason it's not working in, in your particular patient. What do you go to next? And this protein is glucagon. And, uh, and, and so you give one to five milligrams IV every five minutes, followed by a drip. Um, and, and so um, for pediatrics, 20 to 30 mics per kilogram uh, or a max of one milligram. And uh, just know that glucagon, it, it will likely cause emesis, so you might have to worry about airway protection if the patient is obtunded. Um, and, uh, but that would be the, the second, second line drug if, uh, if epinephrine isn't working. You know, we worry about with patients on beta blockers that epinephrine might not work. Uh, some people talk about giving a smaller dose of epi with a beta blocker because you might have unopposed alpha effects and the patient become very hypertensive. Um, don't really have great guidelines on that at this point. There are other drugs that have been have been tried. Uh, this is a methylene blue. It's a competitive guanyl cyclase inhibitor, so it kind of it uh, um, kind of jumps over some of the other uh, uh, you know receptors and processes. If 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 beta um, if the beta um, receptors are not being stimulated for some reason in in a particular patient, and then we talk about ECMO. In my mind, if you've got a severe allergic reaction, nothing is working. Um, ECMO would be a reasonable thing if you could get it started quickly enough and get the patient supported because you've got, you've got the criteria of a very treatable disease that will get better over time if you could just keep the patient alive long enough to support, you know, just to get this other treatment on board. Um, adjunctive medications, you know, we, we always talk about these other things, you know, and, and we tell people, give these quickly too. Benadryl, diphenhydramine, 50 milligrams for an adult, one milligram per kilogram for a child. 
corticosteroids, methylprednisolone, you know, solumedrol, decadron, prednisone, and then the H2 blockers, uh, ranitidine or famitidine. But these drugs have never been shown to, to help with this disease. We just do them because we're, we're doctors that want to do stuff, so we, we, we do it. And, uh, and, uh, but they're, they're really not the treatment that we need to be worried about. The epinephrine is the frontline drug, as I've talked about. Airway control, if you've got strider, if you've got respiratory distress, um, if you've got airway swelling, then you need to be thinking about intubating the patient early because the natural history of this disease is these things get worse, and the patients are even harder to intubate and ventilate as, as time goes on. Um, <clears throat> RSI could be contraindicated, especially if bag valve mask is, is impossible, but you're going to have to get the patient intubated some way. You have to realize these are patients that are, are at significant risk to get a crike because their airway, airway could be such a disaster. So you need to basically know where their landmarks are and uh, maybe even mark the neck so you would know where, where the membrane, the cricothyroid membrane is if you, um, if, if you needed to get to it quickly. Some of the triggers, um, the uh, you know, food, the nuts, the, the tree nuts um, are particularly bad. Um, penicillins, the drugs, those, are, those can be bad. Um, allergy shots, patients can have you know, allergic reactions to their allergy shots and then bee stings. And then there are a bunch of other triggers that, uh, that have, been, have been described and are kind of unusual. So it would be good as much as you can get a history from bystanders or um, from the patient if the patient's stable is, you know, um, were they outside? Were they exercising? There's a particular situation where you're allergic to certain foods and then you go and exercise and that sort of exacerbates everything so you can have an allergic reaction that way. Intercourse can cause anaphylaxis. Um, and so it, you might want to ask about that. Um, and, uh, and then the um, epinephrine auto injectors um, are, are going to be important um, for these patients to have. Some other exposures, the bird, there's a bird egg cross reactivity between the egg albumin and tissue albumin. So of, of, of certain meats like, like chicken. Uh, if, if patients are allergic to cat, if they have a cat albumin allergy, sometimes they can be allergic to pork. And, uh, and then there's this one particular really weird situation where patients that have had tick bites can develop delayed reactions to mammalian meat. Um, and, uh, and that's the lone star tick. And that's being described more and more. Uh, it's pretty strange, but those are delayed anaphylactic reactions to meat. Um, and it's this particular um, lone star tick, which you see the area, which would include our area that this tick is endemic in. Um, we worry that we know what the common presentation of allergic reaction is. It's uniphasic. It's a trigger and then rapid development of symptoms that peak and then come back down hopefully within, within 30 to 60 minutes. Um, and, uh, but they, we do have to recognize that there can be biphasic reactions where reaction is, it it's, seems like it's over, but then it, it comes back um, hours later. Um, and most second phases will occur within 10 hours, but some are day laid out to 24 hours or a little bit longer than that. It can happen in five to 20% of cases, 3% adult and 15% of children. And then there's one particular syndrome where it's kind of a protracted, longer situation where the patients are in the ICU for a while, for days to weeks, trying to recover from an anaphylactic. That's pretty rare, fortunately. The risk factors, if you've got asthma, asthma is a bad combination with, uh, with anaphylaxis. Um, some of the others, if you have hypotension, pharyngeal edema, uh, an ingested allergen, or if the patient has to have multiple uh, epidoses. And then we're basically thinking about these patients. We're either going to send them home from the ER or they're sick enough, we're going to put them in the ICU um, at most of the time if they're really bad. Uh, this is a picture of pediatric anaphylaxis. I mentioned the EpiPen Junior. It's 0.15. Um, you could use it for patients under 15 kilos, uh, although it's not, it's not, the box doesn't say that, but, but you, you could if you're stuck. Um, and it would be better for the parents of a 10 kilo kid to have an EpiPen Junior than it would for them to have a bottle of one to 1,000 Epi and to try to draw that up and do that in the middle of an anaphylactic reaction would be 
uh, in a situation particularly prone to errors. So if it's not anaphylaxis, what could it be? We see ACE inhibitor angioedema, um, and that you know, causes pharyngeal uh, swelling. And uh, the key thing is the patient is on an ACE inhibitor. Uh, there's restaurant syndromes that have to do with uh, histamines that, uh, or MSG-related symptoms that can, that can look like anaphylaxis. Carcinoid syndrome, syndrome is a cancer syndrome. Um, and mastocytosis is becoming more common, uh, commonly diagnosed, where for some reason the patient's mast cells just decide to release their, their, their histamine and then the patient can get these systemic reactions. There's other tumors, eosomal chromocytosis. Um, there's POT syndrome, the uh, postural orthostatic um, hypotension, and then unfortunately, you know, some patients even fake anaphylaxis or there's Munchausen syndrome where they are faking it with their, their kids and things, and that's, that's difficult and problematic. I won't go through a lot of stuff because I'm out of time, but um, the um, epinephrine auto-injector, it's key that patients be, be sent home with an auto-injector, at least two of them, and then um, they have to carry them at all times, which is incredibly difficult. Um, we have to uh, remember that the biggest problem is not giving epinephrine. It's a relatively safe drug, even for older patients with coronary artery disease. I didn't go through that as much, but, but really, in the doses that we use, um, there are very few complications that happen with it, and, uh, and there are really very few contraindications. Um, we have to know the drugs backwards and forwards. Uh, we have to be able to give the, drug, the treatment quickly, and we have to be the experts. So with that, I will uh, stop and see if there's any questions. And I went over a little bit. Go ahead, Walt. Question again? Two questions. I run to the back. Um, <laughs> so to follow up on your last point, first, I think, um, can any of the, you know, things that any of the actors that sort of look like anaphylaxis, uh, can you think of anything that any of them that would be harmed by getting a shot of epi, is I guess what I'm asking. I don't think so. I, I, I mean, I, I expose pheochromocytoma, that's, uh, that's already, you've got this, you've got these catecholamines, these epinephrine-like drugs in your system that a, that a tumor is basically producing and then releasing. So that would be a particularly bad one. You might want to, you know, if you're worried about that, that, that's so rare, it's even hard to diagnose. I guess if you've got a blood pressure but you know, a lot of patients with, with early anaphylaxis, they're they're so stressed out that their blood pressure it's going to look super high anyway. So I, I don't think so. I, I think you know, common things being common, if it looks like anaphylaxis, I would treat it like anaphylaxis because, um, you know, I don't see the downside to it. Uh, it's probably not going to help an ACE inhibitor induced angioedema. Um, that's more about airway control and deciding if you do need to do airway control. Because to my, in my, as far as I know, even the new drugs um, haven't been great for that. Um, even some of the new immunologic group drugs that we have. Um, so yeah, I think since the, most of the errors that people have made have been not giving epinephrine or waiting for Benadryl to work, then I think you, that needs to be your mindset is I'm going to give this drug unless I'm sure this isn't an anaphylaxis. So I was at triage the other day. I gave it twice. <laughs> I'm sure that people were kind of frustrated with me. Like, like well, what is he doing? Why is he giving epinephrine to all these people at triage? But they came in and they technically met, uh, met the criteria. So I would much rather give a drug that is not needed, that, that, that is likely not to harm uh, somebody than, than to wait and uh, have them, you know, have some horrible complication later because I didn't give it. So. Do you know offhand if uh, sorry, the so the biphasic reaction? Do you know offhand if uh, steroids help to prevent that at all? Like, would getting a shot of steroids? Yeah. You know? People think that they might, but there's absolutely no evidence that I've seen that they would they decrease the chance of a, of a biphasic reaction. It's just it's it's part of the voodoo that we do to ward off bad stuff, but I don't know that it actually matters. Just wondering, because the EMS guys like to give something with that helps. Like they'll give, we'll give steroids, even if it doesn't help right away, we just we want a reason for it. I don't think it hurts anything. So I, again, I don't have a problem with it, but don't think that that's going to be one of your treatments because with steroids would take hours to work, you know, in an acute situation. 
And maybe they could prevent, or, uh, but I don't think there's any evidence of that. And these are hard things to study, right? Uh, to do a randomized controlled trial on a disease that can kill you in five minutes is going to be pretty tough. Um, you know, consent alone is a nightmare, so. I'd like to be in the epi on. This. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, I, I agree. Kyle, you had a question? Yeah, how long are you giving patients to respond to the initial dose of epinephrine before you're starting to grip? Yeah, I would, I would, about three, well, I would give them a dose of epinephrine, and then I would give them another dose, and I would do that in, you know, three to five minutes if, if we don't see significant improvement. And, and fortunately, most time you do see, you know, the, the airway symptoms get better, the swelling starts to go down, uh, but I would give them a second dose. Now, if you've got cardiovascular collapse from the beginning, you know, the com patient comes in, they have no, you, you don't, you hardly even feel a, a pulse, and um, they, they're in distributive shock, then in those patients, I, I, I would be getting the epi drip right then. I would, I would basically, and I would give that much, much quicker. Some people think that when you're, when you, when you have cardiovascular collapse, even though your absorption from the muscle is pretty good, you're not even perfusing the muscle. So how is the sub, how is the IM epi even going to work? So yeah, you've got a patient that's coding or about to have you know have cardiac arrest from it, then I I would give the epi IV then. Anything else? Any questions online or anything? Nope. Uh, I think we answered it. All right. Thank Thanks. you very much.